the recording. Hello everyone, this is a session on a progress on enterprise Fedora desktop. <coughs> Roughly a year ago, we did a talk at the GoaDeck where the idea was to show that with relatively small effort, we can combine the server developments that were happening for last seven years with the uh, desktop improvements to produce something that makes Fedora and well other Linux distributions that try to use the same bits um, reasonably usable in uh, corporate environments. And then after that I was sort of advocating that uh, when we talk about enterprise free software desktop, we're actually talking about the desktop we use at home because our life is effectively a life of uh, splitted identities. So you're your own at home, you're somebody at work, you need to have access to all of those identities at the same time, share files, access um, social networks, your blended identity. You might have identity disorder uh, as well, but uh, that's the reality. And overall, uh, if we look at the uh, enterprise desktop, it's, it's really a combination of three big things. So it's a, a client enrolled into some centralized identity management system. It's a tool to perform business tasks, whatever is defined as your business regardless of the uh, actual details of that business. And it's a subject to centrally defined access controls. And those uh, centrally defined access controls actually differentiate us from a desktop. <coughs> and we in Fedora, we have plenty of identity management systems, but as I'm representing here Free IPA and Samba teams. We kind of have two of those uh, sort of highlighted, right? You can do your own identity management system based on uh, Kerberos and LDAP or other means. There are plenty of them now. Uh, but in Fedora, we can now install Free IPA, the main controller, right from Anaconda as a role. And we were discussing yesterday in the uh, server working group that you can do more uh, in, in future and um, do something with it. And on the desktop side, it's obviously a client to that system. So you need to do something with it. And we were also working on the Samba uh, AD part for, I think, four years now. It's uh, not an easy feat. We still have something like 50, 70 patches to be merged upstream to fully support MIT Kerberos so that after that we can start thinking about bringing it in Fedora as a supported solution and there uh, fun will start because people start deploying and complaining and doing the bugs. So we're looking for that <laughs> around Fedora 26. Um, and then we have agents that actually represent what, what the server side thinks the clients uh, should be doing, right? The, uh, these agents, they give you um, identity services. So in POSIX environments, that's POSIX attributes, your UID, GID, home directory, and whatnot, shell, uh, which is a stronger preference for everyone and people fight against them as they fight against uh, uh, choice of the editor. But then you have authentication services and it's strongly coupled with the way how applications actually treat that authentication. There are different methods and so on. Then if you're authenticated, you need to be authorized specifically in the uh, corporate environment authorize it or not to access certain resources and certain applications. That's kind of clear thing. And then the tools to simplify access. So there are a couple examples. So Fedora and Free IPA. So a client that is enrolled in Free IPA uses SSSD uh, project and a daemon as, as an agent. 
and we have both NSS, SSS, and Palm SSS modules configured in the standard Fedora stack. Even if you don't use SSSD, that doesn't change anything, but it allows you to switch on SSSD and don't change any configuration. It just starts magically working. <coughs> and then SSSD performs a bunch of things, fetching the data from free IPA server and applying decisions, authorization decisions, based on that data. And one of the examples is also that OpenSSH is use, uses the SSSD to look up public keys of the servers you connect as uh, OpenSSH client to, um, to verify their identity. But it also is used by OpenSSH server to verify a public key of the user connecting to it <coughs> itself. And the same for uh, certificates that will be later. Then also the uh, pseudo rules can be configured globally and set for specific services and specific servers that you can access if you're a member of this group or that, or if you're in certain decision. <coughs> and for the uh, Samba AD case, while there's no Samba AD in Fedora yet, there is a copper that we kind of do a test builds with, mm -hmm. uh, you still can be a client to Active Directory, which means you can be the client to Samba AD as well, because Samba AD tries to be compatible protocol-wise with Active Directory. And you can have two different combinations. One of them is a pure use of Samba tools, like Windbind, or a hybrid uh, combination where SSSD is used to actual authentication and identity management and WinBind is used for the uh, tasks where you have to do SMB protocol magic. <coughs> That's all beneath the floor. So what we can do with this, what, what user would see. And the thing is, we need to have some metric that we can say that we are successful or not here. And one of the simplest metrics is the amount of, we are talking about single sign-on into desktops. Effectively, if you're centrally defined, you're centrally authenticated, there's no need to have this all uh, authentication happen every single step and ask the users to enter passwords. So let's do the passwords as the metrics, right? Our metrics would be a password. So a typical situation, if you reboot a machine, <coughs> and you put into the operating system prompt, which might optionally ask you to decrypt your hard drive, do boot password verification, there might be some, some stuff on it. Then you sign in into a typical a local account, then you jump on the uh, VPN, because before that you cannot really authenticate against the uh, thing on the VPN. If you're working in the office and you're in the wired network, then you might be uh, just happy, but in reality we could work from the hotel, from home, and we don't have access to VPN every time. Then we get the Kerberos credentials <coughs> and finally authenticate to the services with a single sign-on. That's good, but how far we are from going into this imaginary situation, you put into operating system, you use your remote credentials and you access applications that are not on VPN. So you're immediately there. Well, let's try to log in. I hope this is the, the videos that we actually recorded in February for the DevConf. They stand still uh, as, as a practical example. So I'm, I'm logged in into the system and I got some ticket Kerberos ticket while I'm not on VPN and I use that ticket to actually log in into VPN and let me see if I press the wrong button 
but basically you can see that I logged into the desktop. Somehow, magically, I got a Kerberos ticket. I logged into VPN, and now on VPN, I've got the rest, and I can actually access my resources. At no point I entered any credentials other than the original ones. So, yes, this is a client for Free APA. The Free APA server runs a special thing called uh, KD, uh, Kerberos proxy. It's an HTTPS service that effectively tunnels request for Kerberos over the internet. While Kerberos itself was designed to be used in the hostile environments like internet, there are a couple of exchanges that are not really protected uh, well. They could be used to attack you so far. And using an HTTPS tunnel sort of takes care of these first few steps that are that, uh, not protected. And this is actually was developed first by Microsoft trying to solve problems of their own clients in 2007. They deployed this in Windows 2008 server. And it has the actual spec very well defined. So in 2014, uh, Nathaniel McCallum implemented this spec first as a separate application. Then we got this integrated in Free APA. And uh, later in 2015, um, the guys from Open Connect VPN implemented this in C and integrated with the Open Connect server. So we have, I think, GNOME.org now running this proxy um, for two years already. And, and using this to access Git repositories with Kerberos credentials. <coughs> the important thing here is that you can turn on an Open Connect server and you get the proxy for free, so you can use Kerberos exactly. through Open Connect and then use the ticket to connect to the VPN. Yeah, exactly what happened in this video. And uh, yeah, Open Connect is one of those that support it. Open VPN does not support Kerberos, and uh, ten years people are struggling to uh, explain to Open VPN developers that. What is the use case and how it works? Well, um, instead of OpenVPN, uh, iKey version 2 spec has uh, progress on f formally defined the GSS API, which is the uh, API to do the uh, single sign-on, um, including Kerberos, uh, in the spec. And Libris 1 is working on implementing that spec so we're going to get this. The funny part of the uh, IKEA V2 extensions that Microsoft did since, uh, yeah, I think 2000, and they have this in the Windows 2000 onwards, um, effectively give you the same ability. You do JSS API uh, inside the uh, Swan IKEA IPsec implementation on Windows side already for 15 years plus. <coughs> we are coming there. So, if you have a VPN, yes, that's a good thing, but you probably don't want to trust uh, people with a Kerberos ticket to log in into your VPN infrastructure. You want to have some assurance that these people are not stealing the tickets, but they use it some uh, more serious uh, means to obtain the ticket. And free IPA supports two-factor authentication internally and through the other uh, radius-based means. But effectively, you can use a <coughs> variety of means to, to define those factors. And one of them is the uh, free OTP um, application, which is based on Google Authenticator before it became proprietary. It's a, it's a clean implementation. It's, oh, it's now a clean. It was always. Okay. Yeah, but the idea was coming from, from that one. Yes, and free OTP is... This is an official Fedora project, by the way. Yes. It's our first mobile app. <laughs> and Nathaniel did this work. And it works on Android, on iOS. iOS. 
Will they accept an icon different? What's that? Will they accept a new icon? Sure. Yes, of course. That will be good. So one thing that uh, FreeIPA 4.4 will add in this thing is the ability to say how, how strong was your initial ticket? Did you use two-factor authentication to obtain it? Or did you use something else? And then use this information to say, I only can get access to that service if the original ticket was with multi-factor authentication. This is not yet deployed anywhere. It's coming out in FreeIPA 4.4 this August. So w it will allow you to get VPN limited by two-factor authenticated Kerberos tickets, obtain it over the Kerberos proxy. We can go multiple proxies on, <laughs> on it. So how it works, <coughs> again, we continue with the previous demo. And here, what I'm doing is, uh, it, it was done in a, a VM, and I took the uh, YubiKey, inserted it in a USB port of my machine, and actually, to get access to that, I create a special group that has the actual writable access to the USB device. And that's why I'm doing this in the console. You cannot have access to USB device from the browser. You, you limit it there. So, and I programmed this YubiKey in a such way that uh, I basically saying add a token into first slot of this USB key. I don't care what you put there, defaults are there. It programmed the physical hardware and then sent the token information to IPA server so that IPA server now knows that this user can log in with two-factor authentication. And because the user here has OTP type as one of options to log in, it can, can log in. <coughs> so now we locked the screen and immediately an attempt to unlock the screen. SSSD notices that the server actually on the uh, Kerberos negotiation responds that this user can do OTP. So we, instead of printing a password here, we know the user because it's a, a, it's a lock screen, right? Instead of password, we ask first factor, which is the uh, phrase just saying that you enter your Kerberos password and then the uh, token code that you get. So I enter, hopefully, the yes. first factor is the Kerberos password. The second factor is the token, is, is the token value. Yes. And the reason we split it up is so that you can actually do offline uh, login. If you happen to yeah. be offline, you can use just your first We factor. used to have this problem that um, yeah, you. if you enter them together, then the next step would be that GDM or whatever is running there on the login is GDM passes the whole password, whatever mm -hmm. is the password, yeah. to unlock your credential store. And your password now is random, effectively, because mm -hmm. it has this token value that will never repeat, theoretically, right? So on the next login, you will never unlock your credential store because it's encrypted by... A User password. Yeah, a password that's uh, one. Are those strings configurable, by the way, the first factor and second factor? Uh, they are not. Uh, it's coming from SSSD, and we are thinking how to do the, the uh, configuration. Because those would, that would confuse the hell out of my users. Patch yes, buttons. yes, and that's, that's one of the discussions we have with uh, Alan and others for how to get this user experience better. But for you really can can just join things together and you already get a very powerful thing. <coughs> so let's see. Yeah, we logged in. And, the, and another thing here is that I got a totally new ticket now. Totally fresh one compared to what I had before. Oh, it didn't just renew the old one. It did not renew. It created a completely new one. Replace it. That's now a two-factor ticket that you can use yes. to access two-factor yes. services. 
we cannot see it from anywhere here, but because we don't have on the client side actually an API to. We just learned. Oh, in, no. in the uh, Kerberos upstream, week. yes, yeah, last week. week. But at the time when this was done, we did not have any API for Kerberos clients or JSS API clients to, to look up into the ticket and see if there is a tag that, that you can analyze somehow. So the, this is a summary. We got, again, the credential centered only once after uh, we programmed the token with handle the login, uh, show it a different prompt or a sequence of prompts. There might be more uh, which support two factors, but nothing prevents have a system with multiple factors. And if you haven't been at the talk that Nathaniel ran uh, this morning about the uh, secure um, automated decryption, and he was talking about using uh, a tree of factors to define up to whatever, that's defining the, uh, the access levels, and making security not a binary, but a s sliding scale, which is really interesting uh, going forward. So yeah, if we got those credentials, what could we do with them? Do you want to yeah. chime in? Yep. So, once we have some Kerberos tickets, uh, what are we going to do with it? So we saw that you can uh, log in through GDM. You get a Kerberos ticket. You, uh, I mean, if you have a, if your server is configured to do two-factor authentication, you get asked twice and so forth. So finally, you end up with a Kerberos ticket. Uh, so what now? So, so you can pretty much use it with any service that uses GSS API. By any service, I mean it can be. Uh, file storage thing, like it could be own cloud, for example, uh, a web dev server. Uh, it could be a printer, or it could be SSH, and so on. It could be email. So uh, so I'm going to show like uh, various things which we can do with the, with the Fedora desktop once you have a Kerberos ticket. Um, there are still some rough edges here and there which we are trying to improve. Um, so this talk is mostly about like uh, showing the improvements that we have made to, to smoothen some of the rough edges um, and what we are going to do further. So, so first we start with the browsers. Um, we'll, we'll come back to browsers towards the end, but uh, so let's start with browsers a bit. Um, so essentially, even if you have a Kerberos ticket and if you want to access a website or a web application which is supposed to work with these Kerberos tickets, um, they don't really work smoothly. I mean, usually what happens is they fall back to some kind of basic HTTP authentication, or you get redirected to some uh, some SAML form where you have to manually type in your uh, username, password, and then maybe tag in the the second factor from your key. Um, this SAML form is kind of like the GDM screen that uh, Alexander showed. But you, but quite often it's not like it's not separated as first and second factor. You just have to enter a string, which is basically your first factor, and then you concatenate the the, the second factor to it. So this is not really ideal. I mean, it, it should just work because it's that's how it's supposed to be. So for web browsers, it's uh, the these web apps they they advertise uh, something called a negotiate authentication, like www dash negotiate in the authenticate header just like basic authentication. So, so one of the things that was missing was uh, GNOME's uh, HTTP stack, which is libsoup, and then we have WebKit GTK on top of it. Uh, it, was, it didn't have support for this negotiate scheme. So that's why uh, all these applications that have some form of web browser embedded into it, or any, applications that, any application that is doing HTTP in some form wouldn't work with, uh, with negotiate, wouldn't work with a Kerberos authenticated setup. Uh, so this was a problem for a while, as you can see. It was uh, since 2009. So r recently, uh, there was some movement on this. Uh, so here you see uh, an embedded WebKit GTK uh, logging in to a Kerberos authenticated uh, resource without asking for a password the second time. You already have a Kerberos token, 
for the VDLI domain? Yeah, so this is my um, home IP network setup, which is sort of public, except that the, uh, uh, the actual IP server is on the private network, so I need to be on VPN first. And what I show it is that the GNOME Online accounts didn't have any Kerberos ticket, then I enter it from the command line uh, key in it and got the ticket and GNOME Online accounts saw it. So he is the... Uh, uh, so we, this we actually get in a bit... Yeah, a bit ahead far, of ourselves. Yes, yeah. a bit ahead of what we wanted to show. Let me get back here. So we logged in in this epiphany window into free IPA without entering passwords because we used our Kerberos credentials, yes. And um, we did not get any redirect somewhere it did because this application, this web application, which is administrative console for IPA, knows how to handle Kerberos itself. And you can see that there are a couple users and unfortunately we cannot see um, can't see the names, but yeah, the, the names. But this email set to some domain. This domain is actually connected to some other source that we didn't stop before. But let's get to that point. So, what was this? Is a combination of work coming. It's really a collaborative effort across the whole community. So it, this effort started in 2009, then faded because there wasn't really uh, enough st strong willing people to complete it, complete it. There were flying patches uh, from Debian people, from others, uh, from Intel guys to try to kind of reintroduce the Kerberos or JSS API support into uh, Lipso. Mm -hmm. and I think it took last two years or so to kind of understand what is the complexity and uh, consult GNOME guys to finish this, to complete this work. This is all now merged in GNOME 3. Yeah. So, so yeah, so this is the this is the header that the website usually advertises, WW Authenticate, Negotiate. Uh, so, so yes. So why is this important? Uh, so why is the Kerberos uh, or negotiate support in LibSoup and WebKit GTK important? Well, actually, WebKit GTK is just a LibSoup application in this regard. So most of the work was in LibSoup. So, but anyway, why is it important? So one of the things it, it would let us do is that uh, any application that uses HTTP via LibSoup will now be able to deal with Kerberos. For example. Um, you might have seen that you can mount your own cloud or other web dev shares in Nautilus, and they are then available to any other GNOME or GTK application through your file chooser and so on. Uh, those kind of things wouldn't work with a Kerberos authenticated web dev store. So those things will now be possible. I mean, there are still bugs. Um, uh, Alexander has a prototype of a next cloud which uses Kerberos running, but when I started to make it work, there were some bugs. Above. I mean, when you start doing dev, not pure HTTP, but when you start using the dev extensions against this setup, it, it, it kind of gets lost uh, in the weeds of the technology. Yeah, the, the, there, there, there are, are some, some protocol miscommunications that happen because actually the whole flow of, of this uh, SAML was never expected to work over something not HTTP. Web dev is not strongly and HTTP, it's another set of command that uses the same concept, but uh, there is a misunderstanding on the, on the server side of how to handle certain redirects which basically prevent WebDAV to complete its operation, which confuses clients and clients cannot obtain files because they yeah. did not finish the authentication. It's, yeah. it's going to take some time to work on it, but the more important part is why we are looking into this is because we are effectively forced and we are moving ourselves uh, through the social networks integration, through uh, effort of, let's say, Microsoft as well. Microsoft security team is very concerned by passwords because people cannot handle passwords. 
So they look into other methods of authentication and uh, Windows 10 includes my, my passport thingy, which is effectively a glorified uh, OAuth 2 sequence against some HTTP server. Now, you get something where you need to run things against <coughs> an untrusted web server before you actually log in. So <laughs> we, we need to get a sandbox with a locked down and execution environment for a browser engine, right, before the logon. But we need to know how we connect to a network there. So there should be a way to choose a network profile. Then this means network manager needs to be run before logon and get access. Well, we get down to the rabbit row, uh, hole really, really deep. We need to access user-specific data, and it also says that the, uh, the UX should be quite different. And think about cases where we're not talking about graphical logon, but SSH logon with such sequence. It's going to be confusing, and if you, had, if you have your servers running on Azure or other networks, if, if Amazon, let's say, will force everyone to use the same authentication schemes like Microsoft tries to introduce, uh, Linux systems will be in a big disadvantage. So it, it, we try to address something that probably most of us will not see in the next two or three years. But when we get hit by it, we will be hit quite hard. So I'm a little bit, I guess I'm a little lost here. You're, you're describing um, basically having to go manually go through a web interface to it, obtain your credentials. That's what your Windows 10 machine actually does if you register it with Microsoft's password. Except that somehow it gets to captive portals and... Yes, and then you get captive portals in between and get uh, all this stuff all together. And, all and for the uh, offline logons, they have cached sessions, but before you get cached sessions, you have to be online. Really? Yes. Wow. So for... Users, this actually, the work that we did actually means that you can do some neat things. Maybe we can skip a bit. Yes, we will, we will skip the part that was actually there. Perfect. So uh, we add a Google account. So this VDLI right? domain has a Google Apps <laughs> yes. set up. So for this t.vdali, uh, I got the Google Apps <coughs> connected to it and set up so that this user with its email is mapped to a certain user in Google Apps. And it, then you can authenticate, and the authentication actually happens against Ypsilon instance, not the Google Apps. At no point Google Apps sees my password. The only thing they see is my email, validated by my identity provider. So I am in control of my credentials and where they could be used. And then I can log in, I can get inside, uh, manage files on Google Drive, open documents in Google Docs, read email, and so on, with all the uh, user data on my side. <coughs> the infrastructure here, just to be clear, is that there's Kerberos is authenticating to Ypsilon. Ypsilon is using Sandal to authenticate with Google. Ah. So the end result is that you use your Kerberos ticket to log into Google through your own identity Yes, yes. So once we got there with the Google Apps as a service provider, it talks to our instance via Ypsilon, and Ypsilon website has a perfect documentation how to set this up. If you have a free IPA, you have Ypsilon configuration, then setting this up against Google Apps is like five minutes or so. There are still some rough edges, but you can do it. <coughs> do you want to talk about how it was different without the negotiating Kerberos? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so what happens if you don't have Kerberos credentials? You will get a window from your identity provider asking for a username and password. 
and then uh, you enter those credentials. But then everything works as it is. The problem is that at the point when session that session cookie expires, mm -hmm. you have to re-enter those credentials manually, and nobody will be asking. Well, probably no online accounts will show you that yeah, credentials expired. You have to enter them, but with the Kerberos ticket, they can be automatically renewed without your involvement if you're allowed it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so we are also trying to make some improvements to the to the UI for Kerberos accounts in uh, in our settings app. Well, it's not an app, but yeah, the settings UI that we have. So, so we want to like. Um, so till now, so far, you have seen that it's pretty much just a slider with which you can sort of destroy your credentials cache, and it shows whether you can, uh, uh, and it shows whether the, the, the ticket is valid or not. But we want to do a bit more than that. So, so I've got this uh, kind of prototype hacked up. So, so you have, you can now kind of force renew, renewal of tickets manually which might be useful if you have a two-factor authenticated setup. Uh, we usually try to automatically renew the tickets before they expire, but uh, if you have two-factor going on, then uh, you need uh, some human interaction to enter the second factor. Uh, it shows, uh, it basically yeah, even shows... Even on uh, Sorry? Even on the Depends on the kind of renewal. Mm -hmm. I guess... Uh, I can hear more about that. Yeah. Huh? Sorry, I didn't get the question. I, 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 well, you said that uh, yeah, the two-factor authentication, when you get renewed, you still have to have the second factor around? I think so. If, if it's run. a true Kerberos renew, because Kerberos has a, right. an idea of Right, uh, so the Ker yeah, Kerberos, yes, Kerberos library allows you to specify um, prompt. And if the Kerberos library client understands those prompts, it will prompt you like in PAM case. SSSD actually translates the Kerberos prompts into PAM prompts. That's why you see it in the GDM because GDM understands PAM prompts. But right. Here you get it from, from the uh, Norman right. library. So, uh, well, so I, what I guess I'm asking is, is that renew button a literal Kerberos renewal or is it renew or re or uh, re then? Uh, that's what we were discussing yesterday. So, so the thing is, like, I, I mean, as if I understood it correctly, the, the renewal can fail if the KDC doesn't allow you to renew, right? Of course. Yeah. So in that case, uh, the idea is to fall back to a simple key. Oh, of course. Right. Okay. But I mean, yeah. if you can in dash R. a different term for that then, because that's going to confuse yeah, that's Kerberos users. If we, I, I mean, I, I, it, it's the right UI, I think, but I think the wrong terminology. Well, it depends on what you, whether you know what K and dash R. Is yeah. Means. So we we can we can discuss this, and then as I say, this yeah. is subject to heavily discussion. Actually, we had like a year of discussion already on on uh, things. We got to this point uh, thanks to LeapSoap improvements. Now we can actually show uh, u uh, user experience designers what we meant to have their technical, and our discussions proved that translating the technical terms into a good flow, a workflow, is really, really hard. Yes. Without sure. being able to kind of yeah. physically touch it. Yeah. I guess it all depends on how much of the underlying technology you want to reveal to the... Yes. So the other part is um, you could have a collection of credentials and you might want to say that a particular credential is the primary one, so the one that is picked up by default. And this is not yet supported, but we want to have this supported. <coughs> uh, the renewal part is, as, as you saw, just it was, it, it is quite complicated. But if we go back to the browsers, it's also a complicated thing. So well, when, I think half a year ago, we sat down with uh, Red Hat's people who work on uh, Firefox. And we tried to identify a set of bugs that really prevent us having a good user experience with Kerberos, uh, JSS API overall, 
in Firefox. We found out maybe like a 10 ground standing bugs, and we started to address them. <coughs> Some of them are things that really matter from from the UX point of view, like automated discovery things, automated configuration, but we couldn't get to that point without discussing them with Firefox user, design, uh, user experience designers. And to get to that level, you need to really have things smoothly working. And one of the biggest issues that we had was that Firefox, um, when you use JSS API, it's a synchronous, API. You do something, you do a single call. It goes through all the library layers, then does the networking connection, and that networking connection might stuck because you don't have access to an actual server or there is network broken in the process, and sometimes that might take minutes or so, and it is done in the same UI thread that the whole UI is drawn. You get the whole browser locked down. You cannot switch to another tab and do something else at this time. This was since forever, since the Mozilla times. And so guys worked on implementing a fix for this, which is effectively moving the authentication to a separate thread, which actually revealed a number of bugs in, in Fedora design, uh, Firefox design, and we got the patch accepted, which broke some other platforms. <laughs> that was an interesting experience, so it was backed yeah, out, and finally, I think in um, two weeks ago, it got finally merged with all the fixes. And uh, today, Firefox 48 with the backported patches made into Fedora 24 updates test. Mm -hmm. yeah. 48-2, right? Oh, uh, it's uh, actually 48.0-5 that made today uh, into the updates test. Um, yeah, there are still bugs. There are some security bugs that sh which were fixed in a privacy mode which was leaking your identities. Uh, <laughs> It's an interesting yeah. work, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, you want to talk about the auto config? <coughs> well, one of our proposals. Oh yes, the yeah, auto One config. of the proposals we have for auto config is that upstream Mozilla doesn't want to turn it on, but we think we might just try to turn it on in, in Fedora. And the idea here is that when you get to a website that asks you for Kerberos authentication, mm -hmm. it will just do it so long as you have an encrypted tunnel, so long as you have HTTP. Yes, and an interesting yeah. part that uh, if you look into all documentation that says how to configure your browser to allow Kerberos authentication, they all say, yeah, you, you go into these pre uh, preferences, you enter this domain that is... In yeah. fact, the uh, procedure that verifies that you can access the re uh, certain URI actually does a match. So you can specify literally HTTPS home slash slash as, as a value of that uh, variable, a preference, yeah. and that's it. It will match all HTTPS or securely uh, negotiated websites. And then Kerberos library will try to obtain a service ticket to that machine against your KDC, and it's really not until your KDC gives you a ticket to that machine, you connect to the machine. So there is nothing leaking out to a web server until you get the ticket. And usually it's your corporate KDC that controls whether they have a trust between that domain or not, and they either reject or allow you to do the thing. So we are at the point when uh, with this simple change, which does not include any domain name, which basically allows us to do a global preference mm -hmm. shipped. Um, and it's just a change in the default config. Yes, no it's a default config change, no code change. That's a nice thing. Uh, in Chromium and Chrome, it's a bit harder because you either have to specify a system-wide setting mm -hmm. with explicit domain or you have to do a command line options to, to launch it to enable the uh, GSS API support. 
and that's why fixing Libsoap and WebKit GTK actually gives us a leverage for all the apps, for all the embedded things. And if you use email, you are most likely embedding the uh, using the embedded engine that presents you HTML within the application. If that's a corporate email, and most likely it will get to some resources that might behind the scenes require authentication to fetch this icon or GIF picture that somebody put into the email. Uh, so, um, I have a question about the uh, Chromium. Can, can you go back to that part? So the Chromium problem about the uh, uh, camera's configuration. Uh, so, so the uh, statically system-wide method, is it uh, like a configuration file? Somewhere? Yes, it's a configuration file that you cannot redefine as a user. Uh, what, where is it stored? It sees something. Well, the problem is, is it requires a domain name yeah. for every domain you want. You can't, just the the you can't just use HTTPS colon slash slash. It has to be actually like yes. whatever. The uh, nice thing about KDE that they have supported this by default in the Conqueror. So if you use Conqueror, well, you, you might get some problems with the actual <laughs> rendering of the uh, pages, but Kerberos authentication and KDE works. And this is the policy we are recommending to all browsers, that if you have <coughs> HTTPS, just do it automatically. Okay. Yeah. Say there's yeah. no leakage of information. Except to your own KDC. Yeah, yeah. The, the party you already trust. Yeah, you are, yes. Oh, yeah. And it's a mutual trust anyway between you and KDC, otherwise it doesn't work. And I assume that Comper thing is actually supported at a lower level in the browser, so anything. Uh, yes, hopefully. Hope so. yeah. Yes. Okay. It's probably in cute, the cute or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So the flow is synchronous. We fix it. This is the bug I'm talking about, and mm. this is. The uh, Fedora Firefox 48.0-2, which was submitted like a, uh, I think last week, yeah, July 27. I think, 27. I think so. it didn't make actually into the uh, updates testing because the uh, dash five uh, wow. actually overrode it. <coughs> but of course, we don't have uh, asynchronous JSS API, and that would be real answer, and uh, that would require a lot of standardization work between all the parties which is probably years. probably unlikely in reality. Is it something someone is going to try to do or no. just not even work to No. I, so I, we tried uh, to talk with Microsoft <coughs> security people on this topic and their answer was clear. They are moving away from passwords to other means of authentication. So extending Kerberos we, uh, Kerberos is a mutual authentication. Both parties know something that is a pa eff effectively a password. Uh -oh. The password never leaves right. into the network. Uh, it's used to do some sort of calculations to, for the exchange, but it's effectively a, you need to have this mutual authentication. They are moving to other schemes uh, instead of mutual authentication and sure. better user experience based on those schemes rather than um, Fixing the but it's fundamental all problems. At this point. Yes. We don't want to commit to trying to support it. Yes. <laughs> so, practical use of it. Let's do another s funny example. I'm, again, I'm keying it in as myself. Okay. And use Epiphany to connect to the um, open cloud instance I have. I hacked this instance to support um, SAML, so basically support uh, authentication through uh, Ypsilon. And here, Ypsilon does not ask me for the password because Ypsilon allows to authenticate with Kerberos. So I'm inside, I can work with the documents uh, and I can do some stuff and the user is actually within own cloud is created on fly based on the information that Ypsilon returns no. to the application. Now own cloud has uh, <laughs> the, the community kind of split it and next cloud release it, they have their software and the next cloud is actually uh, included 
the uh, SAML uh, plugin into the base uh, open source version. In own cloud case, this was part of own cloud enterprise. You had to pay to get it. It's 10 lines of code or something <laughs> integrating with Ypsilon. So I was joking uh, last year and at them that, that basically in 10 lines undermine the own cloud business. That was kind of a, a joke with, with a future point where own cloud got split. Not because of me, of course, but <laughs> it shows that if you have open core business, it's probably not a good, um, not a viable future business. Need to do something better. Okay, so yeah, this is Ypsilon authenticating against free IPA. <coughs> and now we have uh, supporting GNOME 320, and like we say, there's some bugs in WebDAV. Uh, use of, of the uh, SAML based uh, workflows and overall the SAML uh, flow was supposed to be happening in a browser with a person actually entering credentials or mm -hmm. taking it and for uh, effectively it requires your execution of JavaScript that the server returns you to submit a, 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 a form back, back to the system. Mm -hmm. So if you have embedded browser uh, engine, uh, which disables JavaScript for its own reasons and never shows anything to the user, you stop. Mm -hmm. To answer this problem, the uh, SAML has a special profile called ECP, which is basically for browserless clients and not all uh, implementations support it. There are some bugs in it, and as we found out, even without ECP, if you use a protocol different from HTTP, you, you get problems. So we, we are still thinking how to fix this. <coughs> and the interesting part is that you can, with a simple combination of things, you can actually go much further. So this is uh, the same environment you don't have any ticket, now I authenticate not against my IPA environment, but against Active Directory setup that I have at home. And I effectively administrator from Active Directory. With this ticket and the trust that I established between this Active Directory forest and free IPA, I can access resources in free APA domain. One of them is my own cloud setup. So it's a cross forest trust between the Active Directory instance and free IPA. So you're actually getting free IPA tickets okay. using your Active Directory login. Yes. And again, Epsilon notices the Kerberos credentials they are correct, valid, and the user that is, uh, has this Kerberos principle, SSSD resolves this user into something usable. So Ypsilon generates a packet of information about this user and submits it to the application. The so application actually... Pause it, so let's see that idea. Uh, let me stop here. <laughs> you get some... ID with the fully qualified username because it's it's the way how IPA presents this ID Active Directory users uh, adding their uh, domain here and this is the address in the own cloud terminology where you could send from federated uh, own clouds to each other files against my instance. So that first that first domain is from Active Directory and the second one is from the Yes. So this is the interesting part. You effectively can reproduce a corporate environment at your home at your will if you need. Maybe you don't need, right? But there are a lot of non-profit organizations, non-governmental organizations that actually have some Windows environment and they want to have control over their setup. So there's also a time while they migrate. And they can do this migration without disturbing the actual uh, business that they do, like helping people. 
And of course, yeah, this is very, very enterprise if you run it at home to a certain degree. But um, why not? And uh, specifically, if this is actually would be a, not a Windows server running this Active Directory, but a Samba AD, that would be totally a free software implementing the cool enterprise stack. Yes, and a final thing. <coughs> I didn't get any question about this, but what about the disk encryption? How we can get rid of, of the um, of the uh, the uh, entering password at boot time? Yeah. Yes. So this is this is a demo that Nathaniel prepared for Red Hat Summit a month ago, and just mute it. Oh yeah, I'll mute it. Actually, this one. Yeah. So here is two two windows. This is a server. This is a machine that we are actually putting. Uh, in the server, we install some software called uh, Tang, which is um, a network-bound server that verifies that yeah, you can you can log in. There are more details about it. I hope the recording that was made will be published, and you can see in, in more detail what was there, but uh, on the client side we say that this client is now bound to the server running, uh, to the Tang server running on this machine, um, <coughs> and after we bound we actually say that the disk of this machine, which is encrypted using LUX, will have encryption bound network, network wise, yes, to the Tang. We just did the binding there in the left. Yes, uh, it's hard to see. Yeah, it's hard to yes. see. Wherever we now it, it actually uh, this uh, generates the Draca generates a new um, boot image. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, it's very good dash F, so he's building a new initial RAM disk. Yes. And he reboots. Now it reboots. Here's, here's the magic I don't type the password on the left. It waits until it connects to the server, okay. and the server grants access to the uh, secret that was wrapped multiple times so that the server actually doesn't know what's in this secret that the client uh -huh. generated when it encrypted the uh, partition or changed the key for the, for the partition. It's now okay. he stops the actual server and, now and the type the password to continue. Yes, and he, okay. he had to type a password. So if, you ha if you're in your home network or you're at work, mm -hmm. where you have access to your network uh, demon that actually can verify your life. You got it. Data center. Uh, yeah, it's a kind of a data center at home. Very, very enterprise. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so that's only really related to physical network, right? Um, it, yeah. yeah. yeah but the same technology, right the same technology, it actually does not need to be network bound. It could be bound to physical token that can be uh, uh, somehow detected, mm -hmm. like a net, uh, Bluetooth beacon or NFC yeah. or something. Reader? Yeah. 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 I had a whole talk on this. It so was a whole talk. Uh, watch so it watch next online. week or, or when it appears. Right. Yes. Wow, that's something. That's pretty cool. All right. yes. are, yeah. so, so the whole, right. yes, uh, one minute. Uh, so we really, what we want to achieve with this is to control your own infrastructure. And the other part, which I don't write here, is we are getting older, improving experience while maintaining good security defaults is important. There is a strong opposition to, to get the complex things in use uh, like by 50, 60, 70 years old and, and so on. And they still need the same <coughs> level of security as the savvy young people. We are improving this, uh, we are getting a chance to ourselves, not only to our parents, to actually survive in a world where security is regularly threatened to even exist. Thank you. Thank you.